Hello, good day everyone. Uh, I am Muhammad Ahmad and uh, today we have uh, with us uh, Dr. Mike Dixon uh, as a speaker for uh, today's session. So uh, I would like to briefly introduce Dr. Dixon before starting the session. Uh, Dr. Mike Dixon is a global expert in desalination and water treatment technology, uh, working with membranes and thermal technologies in Australia, North America, Middle East, and Caribbean islands. Uh, Mike has worked across the entire value chain with technology manufacturers, uh, water utilities, uh, oil and gas companies, pharmaceuticals, and research hub. Mike is the CEO and founder of Sinata Inclusions, a clean tech startup uh, working with desalination uh, in innovators with a global uh, with a goal to reduce energy and chemical usage uh, using data science and machine learning. Uh, prior to Sonata, Mike was Chief Technology Officer for Water Next uh, and ap Application Development Manager for Nano H2O, a global provider for reverse osmosis membranes uh, as well. So Mike is experienced with the development of intellectual property and the commercialization of new technologies. He has more than 60 publications in international journals and is an author of several book and book chapters. Uh, Mike is currently a director of International Desalination Association Board. He has been an editor of the IDA journal and reviewer for the Journal of Membrane Science and Water Research. Mike was national pre president for the Young Water uh, Professionals for the Australian Water Association in 2012, won the prestigious IDA Fellowship Award as well. So uh, I warmly welcome uh, Prof uh, Dr. Mike Dixon to uh, uh, to start for this session. Uh, so before going into that, I would like to tell you about the about the, the about the uh, uh, question answer discussion uh, uh, strategy for the for today's session. Uh, you can type your question uh, on the on the panel. You can see on your right side, and uh, then I will communicate that question to uh, Dr. Mike, and of course then we will uh, hear from him his thoughts on 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 that one. So, uh, so I would like to welcome uh, and over to you, Dr. Mike. Now, thank you. great. Well, thank you very much for the kind introduction this morning. So today, I'm going to talk about uh, artificial intelligence and how we've applied it in water treatment. In particular, I'm going to talk about uh, deployments in desalination. Um, so. As you would have heard, my background is mostly in desalination. I've been working in the space uh, for around 20 years now. Uh, so it made most sense that when I was thinking about how we would use artificial intelligence uh, to improve water treatment processes, that our focus was desalination. So to summarize what I'm going to talk about today, uh, I'll explain a little bit about desalination uh, and give an introduction to Sonata. I realize in the UK, there's not a lot of desalination plants. There's a couple. Um, so let's get into a little bit about how desal works and some background on it. Then we'll share some results of energy saving uh, approach using the AI uh, and then talk in more depth about machine learning to optimize reverse osmosis, the key process that we mostly use these days within desalination. Then I'll talk about case studies, some real results that we've got from around the world, and we can finish up with question time. So desalination around the world. These days, there's in the order of about 20,000 desalination plants. Uh, that's a mixture of thermal plants and membrane plants. Thermal plants, of course, is essentially where we boil the water and membrane plants where we push water across a semi-permeable membrane. The energy use that goes with the membrane process is a lot more efficient. So that's the prevalent process at the moment. And a lot of the uh, existing thermal plants are now being replaced by reverse osmosis plants, even in the Middle East, where that's been the prevalent technology for many, many years. Uh, there's in the order of 99 million cubic meters per day of water produced. Uh, just for some context, it's around 40,000 Olympic swimming pools per day produced using the desal process. Uh, so that equates to water for more than 300 million people around the world. So if we think about that in terms of the entire water market 
it's only about 1%, but for those 300 million people, it's an extremely important process because without this process, their areas are usually hot and dry and they may not have any water whatsoever without this last ditch effort to make water rather than using river water or reservoir water. The important thing is that it's climate independent. Uh, so you don't need rainfall. It's not like water reuse that you may have heard talked about from Singapore or California. Uh, it's completely independent of the climate and so sometimes a technology that we absolutely have to use. So here on the left, you're looking at a photo of the Adelaide desalination plant, uh, just as a general overview of what a plant might look like from the air there. This is a plant that I worked at for a number of years through the design build phase and into operations and maintenance. Uh, so what you can see here is two separable portions of the plant, Within each building, you have the pretreatment and the reverse osmosis. In this case, the pretreatment is ultrafiltration, uh, which in the UK you may be much more familiar with. Okay, so a little bit about reverse osmosis, just in case you've not heard how this works. This is RO is the salt removal technique. So this is the thing that allows us to make fresh water from the sea. So it's a semi-permeable membrane like I talked about before. So water will pass through the membrane uh, and salt will pass through at a very, very slow speed. Uh, so in reverse osmosis, we're not talking about a size exclusion mechanism. We're talking about um, sorption of both water and salt through the membranes. So on a technical basis, when we're characterizing a membrane, we look at what's the speed of water through the membrane, and that's very fast. What's the speed of salt through the membrane, and that's very, very, very slow. Uh, and by having those two different rates, effectively it means we remove the salt, although the permeate water still has a small amount of salt in it because of this mechanism. Uh, it not only is applicable to seawater systems, but brackish water as well. Uh, frequently it's used in water reuse where there's not very much salt at all but it's handy for removing other things like organic carbon at the the lower levels um, and other pollutants as well the interesting thing and why at sonora we got involved with reverse osmosis is that in these systems energy can comprise more than 50 percent of a client's operating costs so due to this, we knew that if we could save energy in reverse osmosis, then we would be able to make huge cost savings for these plants. So Energy Recovery Inc. and solar technologies have made great inroads into reducing RO energy costs, uh, but the process uh, we thought could realize further optimization using machine learning. So let's talk about the problem that they face on site. Uh, the problem is that uh, operators tend to be very, very busy. They have many, many things to do on site. And so the time that they have to sit down and think about how they're going to optimize a plant is next to nothing. They might have the best intentions and be some of the best operators in the world, but still only get once a month, maybe even once a quarter to sit down and think about how am I going to make the energy use less on the plant. So uh, additionally, um, let's think about how a day in the life of an operator might look. So they might come in in the morning, they start 7, 7.30 in the morning, they're usually early kind of people on their shift, and they uh, get themselves a coffee, sit down at the controls, and the first thing that they notice is that 100 different alarms are going off around the site. So slam down the coffee, and head out onto plant and start fixing some of these problems. And that might be a broken pipe, a pump that needs repairing, or something else that's not quite right on the plant. By the time they've made these fixes, they come back into the control room and now there's a thousand alarms going off. So this happens day in, day out, week in, week out, into the months before they ever get a chance to sit down and think about 
how are we going to optimize this plant? So the solution that we've put together is based on artificial intelligence and machine learning is a subset of that artificial intelligence. I'll go into a little bit more detail on exactly how it works in a moment. But the solution that Sonora put together is an optimization software that saves energy and chemicals as well. Our first focus is on that energy, particularly at large seawater plants, because our basic equation is the saltier the water, the more energy it takes to desalinate that water uh, because of the osmotic pressure that needs to be overcome even to make one drop of fresh water. And then generally these large plants also need to clean their membranes uh, using chemicals. And so we can optimize when and exactly how much chemical they use as well. So our system we've made really, really easy to use. Uh, it comes in two forms. Depending on the cybersecurity restraints at the plant, either an operator will receive an email that says, here's three set points per train of membranes to enter into the SCADA system manually. Usually we use that as a test approach, uh, but some plants prefer it just to stay at that kind of level. And when everybody's comfortable with that, then we move to the next level of being directly connected to the SCADA system, where a pop-up box would appear and say, there's new set points to be applied here. Operator, would you like to use these set points? And they can simply click a button and say, yes, push those set points to be used on the plant. Uh, so you can see here that the artificial intelligence isn't taking anybody's job. It's simply informing the operator on how to do their job as best as possible. So I mentioned cybersecurity. We've also designed our system with cybersecurity in mind. Some of the assets that we're talking about provide water for a million people, maybe even more. And so if the plant was to go down due to a cybersecurity attack, uh, that would be very detrimental to the community. So we need to keep our system very, very cyber secure. And as such, we're currently working on ISO standards to improve even the current design that we have. Uh, but essentially on every project, we work to making sure that the local cybersecurity restraints are in place and we're doing the best thing possible for the plant. On every project, we deploy in three different phases. So when I'm talking about some case studies later on in this presentation, it's handy for you to remember phase one, phase two, and phase three uh, to help with the context of understanding each one of those, con uh, those case studies. So in phase one, this is a demonstration where we perform an audit using historic data. So simply we say to the operators, we need you to share some data from the plant. And this could be six months, 12 months, hopefully even more. And we take that historic data and we feed it to our machine learning algorithms. We then tailor the machine learning algorithms to be specific for that plant. It's not like we have one algorithm that fits every plant perfectly. We have one base algorithm, and then for each plant, we tailor it specifically because each plant has its small nuances. So at the end of this historic audit, we say, we need you to improve these particular instruments. Uh, and or we say, we believe we can save you this amount of energy based on what we saw from the historic data. So for a large seawater plant, that might be in the order of three to 5% of the energy use on the plant. Then we move on to phase two that we call the semi-automated mode. So here the plant sends us data on a daily basis and we process it usually in the cloud. Sometimes we can do that on premise as well using a specific machine there on premise. And then at the end of the day, we send back a set point and the Operator reviews the set point and enters it manually into the SCADA system. So by doing this, this increases the trust that we have with the operators. 
And over time, they learn to be comfortable with the set points that we provide. And then we're able to move on to phase three. So phase three is not for everybody. It depends, like I mentioned before, on the cybersecurity constraints at the plant. So this is where we're fully automated. And by fully automated, I really mean that we're connected to the SCADA system, but a pop-up box appears with the set points contained in that pop-up box, but it's still the decision of the operator to say, yes, I'd like to use that set point by clicking on the button to make that work. So that's our phase one, phase two, and phase three for energy and chemical efficiency deployment. Okay, so I love sharing results. Let's get into some of those results. At a high level, if we are to deploy our plant at, let's say a 300,000 meter cube per day plant, which these days is about the uh, average size of a larger plant. Um, these days, the largest plant in the world is in the order of 900,000 meters cube per day. Uh, once upon a time, 300,000 was a large plant. Uh, this is like the Adelaide plant that I worked at in Australia. Um, these days, it's not quite so big of a plant. Um, but at a plant like this uh, in Australian dollars, this plant might be saving in the order of $3 million every year. Uh, and that would be represented by a 10% saving. Uh, so this might be a, a combination of both chemical and, and energy at the end of the day for a plant like this. Um, but it means we're going to be saving CO2. Uh, and subsequently, that might mean a, if you compared to trees planted, 600,000 trees planted or several thousand cars taken off the road. So you can see not only are we making an OPEX impact for these big plants, but we're also making an environmental impact as well by saving this en energy and saving CO2. So that's our big aim uh, at Sonoda and what drives us on a day-to-day -day basis is saving that CO2. Uh, and our goal is that from this technology, we would save 12 million tonnes of CO2 every single year when we're deployed at around about a 50 to 60% rate all around the world. So these are some results from our very first test in Australia. Later, I'm going to show you some more developed results from larger plants and other places around the world. but. Um, as we progress our story, once we got going, our first plant was in Australia on a mining site. Uh, and this site was about 4,000 meters cubed per day. So here we're looking at the phase one results, uh, the desktop study. And in the red, you can see this is what the plant operators had done over time. And in the green, this is what Sonoda would have recommended on a daily basis. So at the end of this analysis, we figured 9.7% energy savings is roughly what we can do. So on this plant, we save more than what we might usually save on a large plant because it's got a lot of flexibility. And what we learn over time is that when plants have more flexibility, then we make more savings. So a real example of that is, let's say you've got a high pressure pump and its maximum is uh, 80 bar. Um, some plants will say, okay, you can change that uh, from 78 to 80. Uh, but other plants will say, okay, we'll allow you to change that from 75 to 80. Uh, so by having that more flexibility, it means we can save more energy because when conditions in the seawater change, the temperature, the salinity, uh, but also on plant, the conditions of the membranes, when things change like that, it means we're able to have the flexibility to save more energy. So let's move on to phase two. Uh, we got going and the set points were used um, in actuality. And for a while we operated in that phase two. And after that, we actually operated in phase three. The operators directly got a signal to their SCADA system and could simply push go and have the set points used. They were automatically deployed. Um, but what we're looking at here is what we call a before and after test. I'll show you a slightly different test later. But here we look at a single train of membranes. What happened before 
any of our changes and what happened after Sonata came on site. Uh, so here's a little bit of a history of what happened on site here. Um, they had some pumping issues and had to make some repairs. Um, but after those repairs were made, they had a more stable baseline of energy use. So really, if we're making any comparison to what happened afterwards, this we take as our baseline. So when Sonata came on site, you can see the first thing that happened is that the energy use dropped on the first day. Fantastic. We know that the machine learning is working. And then over time, we noticed that the machine learning got better and better, and we saved more and more energy over time. So this was a big learning lesson for us is that as we provide more context from how the plant is working on a day to day basis, the machine learning learns more context and can get better and better. Uh, so that was a fantastic uh, first case study for us. Very, very successful. Um, it allowed us to write up a, a written case study and start sharing that with people all over the world. And suddenly our technology got more and more prevalent uh, and quickly we expanded from the one plant um, to around 10 plants. Um, and now um, our technology has been operated at um, over 30 different plants. Um, actually, we're part of a conglomerate uh, called Gradient. Um, our company was purchased about a year ago uh, by Gradient and uh, Gradient had another technology. Together, our digital technologies have been deployed at over 70 plants. So many of that use uh, machine learning. Um, some sites don't need machine learning or aren't ready for it. Uh, and so um, some simply have a, a software system that helps the operators track what's going on on plants and make sure they're doing the right thing from day to day. So that was a little bit um, about our first case studies. Let's delve into exactly what's happening here and how things work. So starting at a product architecture level, our product is not simply machine learning, but also what we call standard math. So we looked at the usual mathematics and calculations from the physics of how a reverse osmosis system works to ensure that the machine learning wasn't going off and doing its own statistical type thing. It was also driven by the mathematics of how a system is used. Uh, so sometimes you might hear this called feature engineering, um, but essentially we collect about nine different instrumentation pieces of data. And then we push that data through the regular calculations to calculate what's the speed of water through the membrane uh, or the water flux, um, and also what's the speed of salt through the membrane or the salt flux. Uh, sometimes in the industry, we call this um, A value and B value. Uh, they're the things that determine the performance of the membrane. So by calculating those two figures, we then pump those two figures into the machine learning as well. And that helps guide the machine learning. Uh, and this is some of the strength of the um, patent that we have at the moment. Um, so by combining those two things, we have a very powerful product. When we add the third piece of optimization, that's the actual piece that goes and searches for the very, very best set point using the machine learning and the standard math models. Uh, so this searches millions of different combinations um, every single day and finds the lowest energy state of what's going on. Okay, so that's at a high level how our product architecture works. Uh, in deployment, we deploy all of the software through microservices. Uh, so you can see all of the different pieces there. Uh, for example, uh, we use Docker uh, for running each piece of our so software. Uh, we have a publish and subscribe type um, software to queue our jobs and various other pieces that go into the microservices for deploying the software. So why does machine learning work exactly? It's because reverse osmosis is quite complicated. So this uh, process flow diagram indicates just how many instruments there are on site. 
here we're just looking at one train of membranes uh, and you can see all the numbers with circles there indicate each instrument. And so we're looking at quite a lot of things that are going on on the plant. Uh, so as a human, it's difficult to keep track of all of these things. Essentially, as a human, you have to think in nine degrees of space to come up with what the best set point would be. Uh, so this is a great case study for using machine learning because it's very difficult to keep this in the head of uh, an engineering professional. Additionally, is some of the some of how membranes work are unobservable. So here, this is highlighting that on the membrane level, things are going on with the membranes that we simply can't monitor. So the membrane itself is constantly undergoing change, uh, even on a daily basis from one day to the next, that A value, B value that I talked about are slightly different. Uh, and that's because uh, membranes are a chemical, essentially, it's a, a plastic. And every time new water is exposed to the membrane, the membrane properties are changing slightly. Uh, you're getting concentration, polarization of the salts. That's causing fouling on the membranes. You might have bacteria growing on the membranes. And to be constantly looking at exactly what's happening at that membrane level is really impossible. And so by having machine learning, we can infer what's going on on a better level than what the math can do. So you can see now the strength of our product approach, having the math and the machine learning together uh, means when the math is great at something, we use the math. And when the machine learning is great at something, it's usually a weakness that the math has. Additionally, how we increase the energy savings on each desalination plant is by treating each train slightly differently. So the usual way that a large reverse osmosis plant works is that the operator says, I'm going to run every train at the same permeate flow and the same recovery. Uh, so quick introduction to recovery. Recovery is how much fresh water are you claiming out of the salt water? Uh, so simply, it is the permeate flow uh, divided by the feed flow gives you a percentage. So each train is usually operated, same permeate flow, same recovery. <clears throat> and what we learned is that over time, the membranes start to perform differently because of what I explained before. And each train is not exactly the same. So we thought, well, if one train is more fouled and uses more energy, then we should use less permeate flow from that train. And if another train is cleaner, then we should use more permeate flow from that train. Uh, and let's say you had 10 of these trains on site. That means we have a spread of what's the permeate flow and recovery for every one of these trains. And so now our machine learning picks what's the highest flow, what's the lowest flow based on those A and B values across the entire plant. So this is the point at which it becomes impossible for a human to keep up with all of these combinations uh, because the number of combinations that the machine learning will try is in the millions and people just simply don't have enough time during the day to be able to run such math in a manual way. So getting down to exactly what we do on the machine learning level. So we use neural networks. There's lots of different varieties of machine learning, um, but we use this supervised one where we say, we give the neural network some inputs. Uh, the neural network makes some calculations inside itself uh, and we get some outputs out of that. So I won't delve into exactly how a neural network works. Um, there's fantastic videos online of this. Uh, and really the, the nitty gritty of exactly exactly how it works is the, the realm of um, the very best professors in the world. Um, but neural networks have been used for over 50 years. It's just in the last five to 10 years, computing power has become such that it's become very easy to run a neural network in comparison to how things might have worked 40, 50 years ago. 
Um, so it's not a black box. It's not really new technology either. It's just simply we're getting to the point of deploying the technology. So the kind of input features that we use, there's no black box here as well, and we're always happy to share this. This is things like what's the feed water temperature, the feed water conductivity, um, that A and B value goes in as um, feature engineered uh, inputs as well. Uh, then we have some decision variables that might be the concentrate and the permeate flow. It might be the feed flow and the permeate flow. Uh, it might be the recovery. Um, it depends on exactly how the operators want to see those results to enter into their SCADA system. And the outcome variables are the energy used, uh, but also the permeate conductivity. So we wouldn't want to say, here's a state of the plant that uses low, low energy, but it means that the permeate conductivity is going to go sky high. That would mean that we'd be producing water that can't be used by the community because it would be too salty. Um, so we also need to constrain our models on what the plant is capable of doing. So that permeate conductivity is one, the permeate flow is another. Each plant has to produce a certain amount of water per day. Uh, additionally to what's the feed water pressure, what can that pump physically um, achieve, et cetera. There's a few other things as well. Uh, but our key outcome variable is what's the energy used and our whole intent of the optimizer is to minimize that energy in total. So I mentioned the, the standard math here. Uh, that's really important uh, because of the physics of the system. Uh, we've seen many other machine learning systems where they don't use this standard math uh, approach. Uh, and it means that their systems produce wild results that are unattainable by the, the plant. Um, also, it can be dangerous as well. They can damage a plant. Let's say, for example, they're directly coupled to the SCADA and can make automated changes with no human in between. Um, that makes it quite dangerous, particularly if they don't have this standard math approach, um, that the machine learning could try anything that it wants. Um, so we also need to have engineering controls there. Uh, what we learn from um, institutions such as that, that we're, we're talking about today, uh, it's important to continue to have our engineering controls. Uh, and then on the optimization side, uh, we have a cost function. Um, it also gets a little bit more in detail than this, but here's what I can share. Um, but essentially, we're looking for what's the lowest energy state between the feed flow and the concentrate flow. Uh, and you can see this um, essentially three-dimensional plot here uh, helps us determine what's the darkest area and therefore what's the lowest energy state of the plant. Uh, we have multiple methods of uh, optimization and for each plant, slightly different methods uh, work better or worse. So on each one, we try something slightly different, but here's an example of that optimization piece. Okay, enough about the theory. Let's get more into some case studies where we've seen some great successes around the world. So the one that I really like talking about uh, is at a seawater plant in Bahrain. Um, this is a plant that is operated by Engie, uh, if you're familiar with that company, uh, a French company that operates both power plants and water plants around the world. Uh, so the plant's over 200,000 meters cubed per day. Um, so once upon a time, once one of the larger plants around the world. Uh, it's a bit of an older system, despite really only being 11 years old. It uses a Pelton wheel system rather than the usual standard now is a pressure exchanger. Uh, so a Pelton wheel is not quite as energy efficient as the pressure exchanger. Uh, but at Sonoda, we simply work with what the plant has and do what we can to help them. Uh, additionally, they have a feed control valve. Uh, which essentially means they're burning a lot of energy um, across running uh, their high pressure pump. Uh, these days you would have a variable speed drive on the pump and also help the efficiency and not simply be burning energy across that valve. Um, so you can see then it's important to include that feed, feed control valve in the machine learning as an input. 
on this plant, they have 25 plus one traits. Uh, so plus one being a spare and each contains 118 pressure vessels with seven membranes inside each pressure vessel. Uh, so you can see the modularity of the plant there. Um, and hence on this plant, we use that multiple train philosophy um, that I talked about before. Um, it's got um, dissolved air flotation and media filters as its pre-treatment. Uh, which means from time to time we have feed water quality excursions that we're operating right now and going through one of those excursions as we speak. Uh, it's had stable performance for around 10 years, uh, although in summer they do have algal bloom events in the sea or a red tide. Uh, and in winter they have cold temperatures, which makes it difficult for them to produce the permeate required by the city that they send water to. Uh, so this is working with NG, as I mentioned, uh, and it's for municipal water use, uh, and it simply treats seawater to create drinking water. So here we're looking at the phase one results. With NG, we work through multiple different iterations to think about exactly what's the best way to handle how their plant works. So there were various valves that we might not normally see on a pressure exchanger system. So we, we experimented with, would we be able to save extra energy by manipulating multiple valves, not simply that feed control valve that we talked about. And uh, after doing various scenarios, we found that the best one was actually just to operate that feed control valve um, and the flow and recovery on the plant. So here on the desktop study, we saw about 4% expected energy savings. Uh, and you can see that it's not always 4%. It's not like a steady line. Sometimes we save more and other times we would save less. Uh, and so that's because, okay, what's the temperature and salinity on site? What's the quality of those membranes? That's why we see this additional, uh, or sorry, variable savings. Uh, so we also said, hey, you guys operate only at 42% recovery plus or minus, not very much. Um, why don't we ask the machine learning what would happen if we went to much, much higher recoveries? Uh, so we said, well, what if we went up to 48% recovery? Um, so by doing that, that's how we got our 4% savings. Um, but we worked back and forth with the operators and they said, well, we can't really do 48% recovery. That's too high. Uh, and so we landed on a realistic recovery of 43.8%. Now that sounds like not a round number and quite strange. Um, they have a trip limit at 44% recovery. Uh, and so we wanted to be a little bit under that trip limit. So we weren't constantly accidentally tripping the plant. Um, each trip that occurs, they lose water flow. Uh, they've only got 30 minutes back up. Uh, and so if the train is down for any longer than 30 minutes, that means um, they're not producing what they need to for the day and get penalized for that. So we said we're going to limit that flexibility. And so, hey, when we move to phase two, we're probably not going to save quite as much energy because less flexibility. So moving in towards phase two, uh, we found this international performance measurement and verification protocol that helps us get um, a very reliable test uh, that we can all believe the results of. So what we do is we look at what's the baseline. Uh, we look at how the plant operates with Sonata not there at all. Uh, and then we start Sonata and then we look at an adjusted baseline. So things might change over time just naturally. Uh, and then what's happening with um, the uh, incumbent, basically, is the technology that's being used to save the energy. We look at what's the comparison between a control set and a test set. Uh, so by using this approach, then we can say we all believe the energy savings that's been produced. So we use that and moved into phase two. And... This is what we saw in the top graph for energy use. So here on the left, you can see the baseline period in the red, 
these are the control trains, and in the green, these are the Sonoda operated trains. So we had five control trains and 15 trains operated by Sonoda. Uh, so you can see plenty of data there to average and make a very, very fair comparison of um, operators versus the machine learning. So in the first little bit of testing, we saw 0.8% savings. Uh, so as you may recall from the previous results I talked about, uh, over time, we save more and more energy because the machine learning learns more and more. Uh, then we had a quick break and then we came back to testing. And then over the next period, we saw things raise to an average of 1.8%. Uh, and then another quick break and then we went back up to 2.5%. So you can see here that uh, over a month, month and a half or so, we were saving uh, more and more energy. You can see over time, the machine learning was able to control the energy use on plant. Uh, whilst the operators weren't able to control energy use and their energy went up and up and up as the membranes fouled um, and they had more problems on site. An interesting factor that we wanted to check on was that this technology wasn't overly fouling some membranes on the plant. So here we're looking at what the differential pressure is. Uh, so that's uh, what's the pressure going into the membranes versus what's coming out? And that's a good measure of gross fouling, any bacterial material sticking to the membranes, any organic material in there. Uh, and you can see that um, the green line, Sonoda, is usually quite parallel uh, to what's going on. So we set a limit before the test of we don't want Sonoda to be any more than 5% worse. We were under that 5% level, and in reality, it's so parallel that we don't think that um, the machine learning is doing anything detrimental to the plant, um, so much so that we really don't even talk about it anymore. So that was a good win as well. Um, so that was a great case study. We also put together a digital twin uh, to see whether uh, we could look theoretically on how much the plant would have saved. Uh, so basically, that would allow us to run all 26 trains on site and not ha have to have a basis for comparison. Uh, so the model did okay. You can see the blue and the red is the uh, predicted versus actual. Uh, and here we're looking at the error percentage. So it's in the order of 0.5%. Um, it's okay, but it could be much better. Uh, we decided not to use this approach, um, even though you can see it's, it's quite possible to use. Okay, so that's a big energy saver one. Uh, let's get into a second case study here now. Um, so here we're going to think more about um, saving chemicals. And instead of saving energy, we're going to do the flip side and produce more water instead. So this was a site in Australia, uh, a brine concentration unit. Um, we operated uh, three RO trains on site. Um, Sonoda operated one and the operators operated the second one and the third one we decided was too fouled and uh, we ignored it from the trial. Uh, it's 60 vessels and four elements in each, so a lot smaller than the previous test that I talked about. So what we did to save uh, chemicals on site and produce more water here is to alter the permeate flush interval. So not a lot of plants will flush using fresh water. Some do, this one does. And here it's an industrial plant, so they flush on a regular basis. So it's every few hours they'll make a flush. Uh, and so looking at what's the time between those flushes um, meant we could make more water. If the plant is operating more and not offline, then it's allowed to make more water. So in the green, you can see where Sonoda operated um, and the, the flush interval, the red, where the operator did it. Here, we're just looking at um, percentage based on 100% being the average operation. Uh, and you can see that it's very different to uh, what the operators do, what the machine learning recommends. Um, but from time to time, the operators would copy what the machine learning would do. Here, you can see the machine learning went first and the operators kind of copied it. it. 
Um, so we probably yielded more savings um, than we're going to show here today. Um, but uh, we were able to produce more permeate, 6.2% um, uh, to be precise. Uh, and this graph shows uh, the Sonata train in green versus the operators in red and the cumulative amount of water produced. So you can see by the end, Sonata was producing more water than the operators were. Um, it also meant that we were cleaning the system less. Our system recommended uh, four less clean in places over two months. This plant cleans once a day, once every two days or so. So we were able to extend that and save chemical as well. We saved 8.7% EDTA. And how were we able to do that? Uh, we did it by uh, controlling the differential pressure, that fouling metric that we talked about. Um, and we also improved the quality of the membranes. Uh, so the salt passage is that B value that I talked about before. Uh, we were able to control that better than the operators could. Um, you can see here there's this excursion here where the operators weren't able to control the differential pressure and through extended cleanings they weren't able to recover it, whereas the machine learning operated very, very stably throughout the entire period. Okay, so that's all I have time to talk to you about today. It looks like we've got 10 or so minutes for questions. So over to you guys. I'm very interested to hear what you have to ask. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mike. It was really uh, amazing and nice presentation, uh, particularly from AI point of view, because, because it's not uh, very well established yet and we have not heard many uh, talks and things done already on this side. So it's really amazing and I can see what AI can do, particularly in large scale uh, desalination systems. So, so that's amazing. So uh, I have uh, got a few questions, uh, uh, maybe that will uh, further enhance the, uh, the impact of uh, this AI-based findings uh, now to understand on the, on, the, on the real scale implementation. So uh, the first one is uh, regarding the acid dosing optimization. So do you think AI can, uh, can improve uh, the, the desalination plant performance from this side as well? For acid dosing, um, yeah. yeah, depending on the plant, not all of them use acid dosing, um, but sometimes it's used to change pH uh, of the system, uh, sometimes to prevent scaling as well. Um, so it can be used. It's not something that we've done in the past because uh, mm -hmm. our focus has been on, you know, what's the best bang for buck? Where do we make the best OPEX savings? Mm -hmm. um, I think that there's a reasonable amount of savings to be had. Um, I know other people in the industry have been working on um, acid dosing and things like anti-scalant dosing. Uh, mm -hmm. It's not something that we've got into just yet, um, but eventually we'll work on a plant where they find that very, um, you know, extremely valuable. Um, and then we would deploy a very, very similar um, approach using a neural network. Hmm, thank you. So, uh, uh, secondly, uh, do you think the, the design of these plants, because most of them are uh, the very robust designs, uh, well-established uh, methods, but AI can optimize the design in, uh, of the conventional uh, systems as well? What do you think for the, for the upcoming uh, investments or developments? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, as long as data is available in large volumes, then artificial intelligence is really good. Um, so this is something we experimented with a lot is how much is enough data. Um, mm. So we looked at, okay, can we use one data point per day uh, to optimize a plant? Um, and the answer to that is no. Uh, mm. There's just not enough data. You need the massive volumes of a year of operation to be able to drive these models. Um, so the message is for design optimization. Um, absolutely, artificial intelligence can help if you can find enough data to drive the decisions that it needs to make. Um, and there are companies doing this. Um, there's uh, a company out of um, Hungary working on exactly that. Uh, and at 
one point in time, I'm sure that uh, we at Gradients and Order will get into doing that as well. Oh, okay. So we have got one question regarding the safety protocols. Uh, so they are asking that mostly in any plant, it is always difficult to connect directly with SCADA. Mm, so exactly. What details you would need if you want to uh, to connect your uh, AI-based maybe algorithms with your SCADA system or? Yep, yeah. Um, that's why I described the different phases that we have. Uh, so generally we find it allowable that the plant will send us data um, usually by email, but we set up an automated system. So it's usually allowable to push data out of the plant, um, but frequently it's not allowable to um, push data into the plant. Um, so from cloud into the SCADA system. Um, in some cases, yes, um, smaller industrial systems don't always have as tight controls. Um, but in the cases where we're not allowed to push data in, that's why we use that email system instead. Um, and we heard of a case study, not us, but another company more recently um, that had some issues with this and caused some problems. Um, so it's a very, very smart thing to do is not allowing direct couple to the SCADA system until the operators are very, very comfortable and we fully understand the risks that can occur there and make sure that there's engineering controls in place. Um, from an engineering perspective, I would want to see multiple levels of control on constraints um, with SCADA having the highest level of control on the system. Mm -hmm. Good. So uh, is there any case study you have done on ultrafiltration as well? Uh, using ah, this? Yes. Yeah, um, we're working on an ultrafiltration at the moment and expect to see a case study in the coming months, actually. Um, but it's a really good um, approach, actually. So in ultrafiltration, you want to be looking at uh, what's the time between backwashes um, and what's the time between um, uh, chlorine-enhanced backwashes and um, CIP cleans as well. Um, so by looking at that, you can improve uptime Maybe your system might currently be, I don't know, 93% um, operational. Um, by having less frequent backwashes, depending on the water quality, you could go up to 95, 96%, something like that, and increase availability. Uh, so a very, very valuable algorithm, uh, and we're, we're close to being able to talk about that in a more public way. So uh, there is one concern as well that uh, did this AI-based optimization of energy minimization and all this uh, cost minimization, does it also impact the water quality or uh, you maintain the same level of quality of water at the output you are getting? It maintains the same water quality output. Um, so I mentioned there what differentiates our algorithm um, yeah. in our patent is that we also monitor the permeate salinity. Um, so that's the biggest thing uh, water quality wise in reverse osmosis, that permeate salinity. Um, so we have that as a constraint within our system. Um, so that the energy use is not able to, uh, or the set points aren't able to affect the energy use in such a way that it's detrimental to the water quality. Um, and let's say you're applying machine learning for a different water quality process, then you would use um, other things, you could use t total THMs, something like that, um, in a, um, a reservoir treatment system uh, to control what's going on on site in other set points as well. Uh, good. So uh, maybe the last one uh, is regarding the, the pushback. Uh, have you have ever felt any pushback from the industry in adopting AI uh, or ML-based methods uh, because most of the people would like to stick I mean, uh, to the conventional methods. So how you feel the, the welcoming or just some pushback regarding the AI adoption? Yeah, yeah. With any technology, there's always pushback. Um, every startup company that I've worked at has always experienced some sort of uh, pushback. Um, but there's always w people in the industry that are willing to try, right? As you have innovators and early adopters, and then you have late adopters and laggards, right? Um, and so um, part of the technology adoption game is to find those people who are willing to work with you. Um, and so we were able to find a handful of people and companies um, that would champion our technology. 
Um, but we also talked to loads of people um, who weren't ready yet and uh, or didn't see the value of it uh, or thought, oh, hey, a, a human can do this. I don't need this whatsoever um, and weren't ready to hear the story about artificial intelligence. Um, so, yeah, we absolutely experienced pushback in the early days. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Mike. Great. Thank you. And thanks to everyone for attending today.